Hello and welcome. I'm Steve Clements, Editor-at-Large of The Hill. Thank you for joining us for Aspiration and Resilience, Arab Youth and the COVID-19 Era. I should be saying Arab Youth, American Youth, Israeli Youth, and the COVID Era, because we're going to cover all those bases. Our virtual event focusing on the aspirations of Arab Youth, Israelis, Americans, why we should in this country care about those issues. This is the second event in a series of four conversations we'll be presenting on this topic. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Embassy of the United Arab Emirates, for making this series possible. Like much of the world, the economy of the Middle East has taken a hit, a big hit, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Unemployment has been a top issue among young Arabs in recent years, and they're looking beyond traditional government and private sector jobs, but COVID-19 has made that more difficult, like everything is more difficult. In the 2020 Arab Youth Survey, done by BCW and Asta'a, uh, it's a study that I take and look at every year, so it's been coming out for quite a bit of time, nearly half of young Arabs say they've considered leaving their country and emigrating elsewhere. One third say they're li more likely to emigrate due to COVID-19. In this environment, what are newly graduated students choosing to do to help bring in money and help their families? What are they doing to help themselves? What are the top opportunities in the region that may lead to improving economic growth and stimulus? Today with thought leaders and students from the region, not only students, but young people who are just making things happen, it's a great roster of people, we're going to discuss how the aspirations of these youth are colliding with reality, especially during this pandemic. Before we get underway, a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us at at the Hill events. That's at the Hill events using the hashtag, the hashtag, the Hill Arab Youth. We're broadcasting live and we'll be taking your questions throughout the program. If you experience any trouble with the live stream, this is where I laugh. Please refresh the page. They say that will be a quick fix. To kick things off, we would like to get a snapshot of what it feels like to be a student during a pandemic. How have plans changed and what are newly minted graduates experiencing as they try to find work? What do the numbers of professionals and professionals say and how is the job market faring right now? We're joined by three students from the Middle East to share their views today. Saeed Al-Shehi is a graduate student from UAE at George Mason University, so he's local to me. Great to see you. Mara Ajilat is an undergraduate student at Oberlin University, joining us from Jordan. And Shavit Rutman is an undergraduate at Hillsdale College, Hillsdale College originally from Israel. We're also joined by Anne Elizabeth Konkel, an economist at the Hiring Lab at Indeed, and she knows this scene really well, to help us better understand the job market, really not just in the Middle East, but what's going on here. I want to emphasize that I'm interested in the world right now and how everybody uh, is, is seeing this time. Shavit, let me start with you because you know, when we started this series last year, we were largely talking to Arabic youth, but because of the Abraham Accords, because of the fact that we've knocked down a bunch of different walls that weren't there before, I just want to be clear, when we talk about the Middle East, it's a bigger picture than we were talking before. How are, I want, as you reflect on how you've adapted, and I want to tell everyone, you're an entrepreneur, you're, you have created a company and you're part of a company in addition to what you're doing there, but I'd be interested in what insights you have and what you've learned that might be useful to those outside of Israel more broadly in the region. So, you know, tell us, tell us how you see things. Uh, well, Stephen, let me begin by um, thanking you for having me on this um, amazing conference. Um, just a sign of reference. My name is Shavit, meaning in Hebrew, Comet, you know, the star. And the reason I mentioned that is because at the end of the day, we all, no matter if we're in Amman or from the UAE or in Israel, we all aim at the same stars. We all have the same aspirations, I believe. And we all somewhat aim at some sort of happiness, like Aristotle said. Um, and yes, to your question, it's been a very um, complicated era for everybody. I believe that uh, just a few interesting stats from Israel in, in August specifically uh, for every open position, there were eight unemployed people just in Israel. Um, and out of the uh, all people that got in a furlough, only 17 percent actually ended up returning to the same position. Um, I think that my best advice right now for the whole region as a whole is to really try to take advantage of all the resources out there. Uh, whether it is YouTube um, study tools or LinkedIn. And quite interestingly, also maybe have this little switch of mindset um, because the job just the job world has tremendously changed. So from whereas we used to think, oh, what do I want to really do? It seems that it's shifting into what's possible for me right now and what can I do? 
So I think my, big, my biggest advice for everybody out there um, and the biggest adaptation is just flexibility. To be able to be flexible, to try to utilize your skill set, to utilize your network, your connections um, into what's possible. Well, thank you for that framing. I mean, it, 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 it sounds both uplifting and dire at the same time. Saeed, when you're, you know, I know that you are uh, uh, over here, you and, and, and Mara over here, but you have a lot of friends, colleagues, families and whatnot back in the region. Uh, and one of the things that came out of this BCW study of Arab youth, two, a lot of things stand out, but two of the things that really stand out is how digital the next generation is becoming. You know, online news, online participation, digital consuming and digital creation. But they, but unemployment runs high and fear about the economy and anger about corruption uh, is very high. And so I'm just interested, uh, and, 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 and say, let me start with you. How, what does your dashboard look like, you know, as you think of uh, one day going back and you look at the economic scene, um, how are friends and colleagues looking at this this scene right now? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kimson, for having me in this uh, opportunity. First, uh, when the pandemic broke out, it gave us a new insight on how things could work out. We are now using more technology, more uh, uh virtual technologies that that made us continue our normal work but through the screen so uh, i think the coming days people everyone in the world in my uae and the us and anywhere else will use these technologies to continue their uh, daily life their work their businesses so i think this part of the pandemic uh, started a new path on how we can uh, adhere these technologies to ourselves that we can use to improve the to improve the, uh, the businesses and uh, education. Nowadays, uh, these young kids, even uh, uh, even doctor appointments are all done online, virtually through apps. You can even book uh, appointment with the doctor, and he can see you and give you the perception through the, the app. Everything became virtually. So I think through the COVID-19, this is a step forward that that's going to change how things are going to work out in the near future. Things will be more virtual. And it gave us, it gave us uh, that uh, something that we were doing in the past doesn't have to be actually face to face. Something, some things could be done online. So I think this is a positive insight and in how the new generation is going to uh, overcome the, the pandemic and how the new world is going to be look like. So thank you for that. Mara, how, what does you know, your dashboard look like both within the region? And, you know, again, I know you straddling. Uh, you know, I was just talking to someone earlier today about transatlantic relations. You really can't say about it. It's, it's transatlantic plus like a whole nother continent. Um, but, you know, in, in, in the world that you guys are, 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 are straddling. But how, what, what are the equities you think are really important for young people as they look at their job prospects, that they look at the economy? I should add one other thing that's a, a part of that BCW study is that young people are saying debt is an increasing challenge, that debt is rising for themselves and their families. Uh, and so that's loading up as they look at this, you know, the, the job and economic scene. I mean, it's it's completely uncharted territory for us. Um, I remember, at least for my parents' generation, when you wanted to find a job, you would call your cousin, your uncle, you know, they would pull some strings for you, and that was it. And then there's been a, a, a recent shift in the past decade or so um, where, you know, university graduates would start um, charting their own path, finding seeking employment by themselves hmm. um, and especially since the pandemic you had all these like Facebook groups pop up at least um, like the uh, the sites that I follow um, where people are helping each other you know write their CV or write a cover letter and etc but perhaps the most important equity in my opinion is how students are seeking um, learning hmm. uh, especially as you know I'm a senior, um, I'm thinking about whether it's worth pursuing uh, uh, postgraduate studies. Is a grad is grad school really worth it? With the rise of e-learning, you know, thanks to COVID nineteen, um, 
it's really making students question whether uh, there's value in pursuing the you know, traditional uh, postgraduate studies when you can s- develop specific skills um, online for much cheaper, much faster, and more convenient. Um, I'm personally, you know, um, pursuing courses online. I know my friends are. I know several people are. And the market size of these, you know, massive uh, open online courses has grown uh, in the Middle Mm. East uh, since the pandemic. Well, you know, one of the uh, things, you know, Shavi is... um an entrepreneur, and I'd love to hear just, the, you know, he, he's he's a fitness guru, I think, you know, but we'll have to tell us more about it. But I think one of the interesting things I think, you know, I think about Israel and I think about programs like Waze and I, you know, sort of look at a lot of the innovations that have come out of Israel, which have been truly uh, transformative, at least, you know, in my life of things that have been there. A lot of people may not know they come from there, but whether or not I know the UAE, I know Jordan, I know others are trying to create um, their own sort of Silicon Valley like hubs, if they will, investing in people, investing in ideas, investing in sort of technology and whatnot. But the big thing that I've always been interested in across countries and across youth are attitudes towards risk. And and I want to get to, you know, Anne Elizabeth and ask her, as you look at the job market out there, are have attitudes towards risk taking, which is part of entrepreneurship, uh, shifted at all? Uh, in a direction that you think is positive, or do you think there are big worry signs out there about the Middle East um, job and employment and innovation market? Yeah, so I think there are um, definitely concerns. We've seen at Indeed the uh, MENA markets impacted in a very similar way to Western markets. As of November 27th, the overall job postings trend in MENA countries was down an average of 30% compared to 2019. Wow. There is a lot of regional variation, and I think that kind of ties back to um, expectations about what is going to happen with COVID, um, entrepreneurship, um, barriers to entry. Um, But kind of an example of that regional variation is that of the nine markets that um, Uh, sites that Indeed has in the Middle East. Qatar was faring the best, just down 2% compared Mm. to 2019. Israel was faring the worst, down 60%. Um, But for for context, the U.S. is down 12%. The Mm. U.K. is down 41%. Ireland is down 20%. Um, And so really it kind of all ties back to different countries have different expectations about the path of the virus. They have different Mm. case numbers and there's also kind of a mix of jobs in each country. Um, But across the board, pretty much in all markets, we are seeing that job seekers are concerned about their health. Um, Some of the fastest growing search terms year over year in the US have been around remote work from home. And I don't really think that's different anywhere else, because at the end of the day, people are across the world concerned about contracting COVID. Elizabeth, and before I before I go jump to the to the students, are, are you finding, you know, when you look at the job market and I'm fascinated by uh, Indeed Hiring Lab and, and, and how you kind of break down and look at <coughs> that arena, excuse me, <coughs> this is an honest frog. <coughs> As you look at that world, what matters in terms of a healthy job and employment market? We had um, Mara a moment ago basically talking about online learning, online upskilling. Do you think that's going to shake up things? And I will continue to drink and get this out. This is is not COVID. (laughs) Go ahead. (laughs) Um, Yes, I mean, I think that remote work in general and just the option to have remote, whether it is education or um, job opportunities, I think that is a game changer uh, globally. Um, In the U.S., we are watching to see how that is going to change things in the labor market. Um, My expectation is that... um, with COVID, everything kind of swung in one direction and that I do think that the needle will, will go back. I don't think it's exactly normal to have such a large percentage of the population working out of their homes every day. Um, And then also not going out and getting that cup of coffee at a cafe, not browsing at stores and, you know, on their way home, picking up, you know, a a top or a book or something, you know, just kind of those leisurely things. 
Um, and so I think that um, just in general, remote work is going to change. Um, my hope is that particularly in the Middle East, it may provide opportunities for more suburban, for more rural regions that um, as a new grad or a student, um, a young professional doesn't necessarily have to move into an urban area to get those opportunities. And then also then they, because opportunities can be remote, that they can learn about those opportunities and apply for them and as Mara said um, about finding a job through family networks, that kind of helps expand the network um, so that uh, those opportunities are kind of shared among um, the individuals in those countries. That's cool. Thank you. I think I've got my voice back. Hello, everybody. Um, Shavit, tell us about your startup real quickly, and then I want to come uh, both to Mara and Saeed and just kind of get at this issue of rolling the dice, taking a risk, jumping out, because part of, I think, the dilemma out there that many young people have after getting educated, I heard it in just Mara talking about choices, is, is you know, road A worth it? Is road B worth it? Is do you go out and strike out on your own? Do you do a balance of getting a job, doing online education? But part of that is personal risk. So um, tell us what you've done real quickly, and then I'd like to jump to, to Mara and Saeed. Absolutely. Um, well, it's an Israeli startup called Arbox that was founded in 2015. It's a management platform for the fitness industry. So whether it is a fitness studio or a gym or any kind of studio, we have the software that's capable to deal with um, of dealing with um, each one of the management aspects of that. Um, truth being told, um, June came around a few months ago. I saw where I stood uh, in the job market. I studied the pre-medical studies. I called one of my friends from Israel, who was um, one of the uh, directors of the company, and I told him, hey, it's time to take risks, move the company to the United States and North America, and the rest is history, essentially. Mm. Uh, we did everything possible to, uh, with the proper fundraising to be able to utilize resources to come to North America. And ever since June, when I started with the company in North America and we created a whole branch here, everything was remote. And we expanded and we created more opportunity to um, other people that we hired here in the United States. And speaking of which, we would love to do the same way in other countries in the Middle East as well, especially now um, post Abraham Accords, peace agreements. We would love to have that, provide opportunity to other people in other markets as well. That's fascinating. Um, and I'm also just fascinated that you made that move during this crisis and that it worked. Saeed, when you kind of look at you know, your country in the UAE, um, and I've been there many, many times and have sort of you know, met innovators, met men and women, uh, entrepreneurs that are, that are moving and doing things. But there's also you know, just an arena on how people look at, at risk and moving ahead. Part of you know, innovating is the possibility that you flop, you know, possibility it doesn't work out. What do you think needs to be shaped or shifted to get that opportunity right for young ideas and young innovation in the UAE? Uh, thankfully, the soil for new businesses and entrepreneurship in UAE really ripe. Anyone can start a business, foreigner or uh, locals. Uh, taking risk is a part of the journey. You must take risk so, so you can achieve what you want. What needs to be done is like uh, uh, adheres people and uh, teach them more about the importance of taking risk and how they should start their own new ventures. People sometimes, they are uh, kind of not used to this. This is something new to start a new business, a new company, a new enterprise. So they are afraid of this. So what needs to be done is like uh, teaching some informal, in some informal ways that people like to teach people that this is the new, this is the new way of, of making uh, making living. People can start their own business. They don't have to work for uh, for uh, the government or the private sector. So it's like kind of mental thing, not uh, the, because the UAE have, uh, have, uh, have provided many things for the new, for the, for the new startups and new businesses. Actually, and uh, according to the World Bank, uh, is doing business, is starting a business, the, world, the UAE placed 13 in the whole mm. world for the ease of doing business. So it's actually the right for business right now. Right. So people should actually, uh, yeah, should actually start their own, uh, their, their own new business. Thank you for that. Mara, you know, I want to ask you the same question, but I want to give it a little bit of a twist because I know you're doing your um, 
honors thesis on the Middle East and the International Criminal Court. So right now we're largely talking about entrepreneurship, but, it, but in a way, International Criminal Court, whether you're talking about, you know, crimes against humanity or you're just talking about rule of law and tax policy, you know, part of the question in the region is whether or not you feel, I mean, this, I know this is a big topic in Israel for the rule of law is very important. People need to know what ground they stand on. If there's one area that comes out every year in the Arab youth study that I look at, is there's a sense that things are improving, but there's worries about corruption, responsible governance. And there's a sense that young people um, are saying, if, I, if you know, I'm gonna put words in their mouth, where they, where they sometimes don't feel heard. So I'm gonna ask you the big question of what has to happen within the ecosystem of the social contract as you see it. It's a big question indeed. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm only gonna echo the findings of the study. Several, um, so many of Arab youth have uh, resorted to immigration. Um, so their response to your question would be, no social contract here. I'll seek a different social contract in a different continent, a different country. Um, others have resorted to radicalism even. Um, there are several different approaches. What is necessary um, to perhaps rebuild public trust in government. I don't think the pandemic has helped. If anything, it's made matters worse, uh, especially after the Arab Spring, uh, followed by um, how uh, countries specifically in the Levant have dealt with the coronavirus as opposed to the GCC. Um, it's, it's looking pretty dim. It's looking pretty dim. Um, I personally uh, cannot say that um, I'm more optimistic now, um, especially, you know, as you mentioned, I'm writing this thesis and um, it, it's been, it, it's made me really confront the reality of, um, you know, promises versus real action. And in this part of the world, we really, really lack real action. Fascinating. Um, Elizabeth Ann, let me just ask you as we come into the home stretch here, I just got a, a question from uh, Khalid in, in Denver. And Khalid is wondering what is the big generational shift that in the, in the other days, you know, people may have thought they had jobs for a time. Now we've got, you know, they're the next generation, the Gen Z's and perhaps the millennials. You know, sometimes they're in gig uh, relationships, sometimes they're maybe entrepreneurs. But are there big shifts generationally that you're seeing in the way people are thinking about jobs, the job market and the social contract there? Um, I have not. Um, it, in relation to the United States, um, I would say in relation to the Middle East, I think what needs to happen is bolstering of the private sector. The public mm. sector looms large in a lot of countries um, and in some cases offers a better wage. Right. And given that there is such um, a large youth population, there simply needs to be jobs to absorb those number of people. And the public se sector cannot just in infinitely grow to absorb all those young people. And so I would say that um, in relation to the Middle East is probably the biggest shift um, that will hopefully be happening, uh, growth in the private sector to absorb um, the mm. young population that's coming of age. Wow, interesting. Let me ask each of you really quickly, because we're, we're basically out of time, but I miss it. If you could change one thing to improve the environment for young people in this time, what, what would it be, Said? I would encourage them to take more risk, actually, because uh, I think this is the most important step. Yeah, if you can overcome this, you can change many things. Mara, I'm going to echo that. I think definitely calculated risk taking, <laughs> even though it's a rapidly changing environment, is the best we can hope for at the moment. And Shavit, I'm going to give you the last word. Um, flexibility, taking risk, and don't be shy to ask other people to help you. Sometimes it's a key component. Communication. 
Well, I really love this. This is the start. You know, I love this. This is one of my favorite topics is just kind of getting in touch with young people. I sort of wish we had a TikTok part of this that we could kind of, you know, do something cool and kind of, you know, get onto some other platforms. But uh, I really appreciate connecting with all of you. We're going to stay at this. One of my favorite topics that we do every year. And I hope you'll come back and, you know, tell us as you've also. Savit Rootman at, at Hillsdale College, Saeed Ali Al Shahi at George Mason University here in town. We'll have to meet up when we're allowed to do that again. Mara um, Ajilat, a student at Oberlin University, and Anna Elizabeth uh, Conkle of uh, Indeed. Um, Indeed, uh, I'm going to get this wrong. It's not spelled out right here. But Indeed. Indeed is fine. <laughs> indeed is fine. There you go. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much.